in this video, we're going to take a look at functions and mappings. Now, before we take a detailed look here at functions, it's important that we understand what a mapping is. So a mapping simply takes a set of numbers and transforms them into a different set of numbers. And note that a mapping is a function if every input has a distinct output. So what that means then is a function can be either one to one or many to one. So what I've got here is three diagrams. And we've got two examples here of functions. And then the last example here is not an example of a function. So for the first example here, this is an example of a one to one function. This is a one to one function. Okay. This example here is a many to one function. So a many to one function there. But this last example here is not an example of a function. This is what we call one to many. And the issue here is then this last element here doesn't have a distinct output. Okay, it's got two outputs here for this element. So in case you're not familiar with what's happening here with these diagrams, what we're taking is elements in set A and they're mapping to elements in set B. Okay, so it's an example of a mapping. And like we said then, these two mappings here are actually functions. So that's a one-to-one -one function and that is a many-to-one -one function. But this last mapping here is not a function. However, what that means then, or what we can consider here, is making a mapping of function by restricting the domain. So a very famous example of this is considering y equals the square root of x. This is undefined then for values of x being strictly less than zero. So for example, if x equals minus one, we can't take the square root of a negative number. However then, if we restrict the domain to be values of x greater than or equal to zero, then we turn our mapping into a function, okay? So it's also worth noting here that the domain is a set of all possible inputs for a mapping. So let me just write a note here. So for the domain, like we said, this is the set of all possible inputs for a mapping. So a set of all possible inputs. Let's just make a note of this here. For a mapping. And then we have the range. <coughs> So the range here, that is the set of all possible outputs. Okay. So you might be already familiar with the idea of the domain and range, but if not, that's what we mean here when we talk about the domain and range. So <clears throat> that's everything that we need there for mappings. So that takes us now nicely into functions. Now, functions are something that you should already be probably familiar with from GCSE maths. So in GCSE maths, you've come across um, the idea of functions, function machines, as well as how to find composite functions and inverse functions. Let's just quickly recap composite functions and inverse functions just in case you forgot. So for composite functions here, so for composite functions, What we mean then when we talk about composite functions here is a combination of two or more functions. And when we combine two or more functions, we create a new function, which we call a composite function. So I just want to quickly note here that generally speaking, when we combine functions, let's say we've got two functions here, f of x and g of x. If I combine, so I get f g of x and I have g f of x. It's worth noting here that generally speaking, these two here are not equal. So in other words, the order of the composition of functions does matter. Okay, so generally speaking, this does not hold. In certain cases, you might get lucky and fg of x will be equal to gf of x, but 99, uh, you know, 99 times out of 100, you'll find that this doesn't hold. Okay, so make sure that you're aware of that. The order does matter. So order matters. Okay, so the order matters there for the composition of functions. 
So that's composite functions, not really you know anything else to add there. And then what about inverse functions here? So for inverse functions, again, we're just really recapping here GCSE material. So inverse functions. What can we add here? Well, if I've got a function f of x, then we denote the inverse here as f with a little minus one of x. So I've got f of x and f inverse of x. So like I said, it's f with a little minus one of x. That represents the inverse end of the function f of x here. Okay, so these are inverses of each other. So they're inverses of each other. So the key point to note here when we're talking about inverse functions is that the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse of x. Let me just write this here below. So the domain, the domain of f of x, that is the range of the inverse of x. So of f inverse of x. So the domain of f of x is the range of the inverse of f of x. And then in a similar pattern here, the range of f of x is the domain of f inverse of x. So let me just do that up here. So the range of f of x That is the domain. So that is the domain of f inverse of x. Okay. This will save you quite a bit of time when we're working with questions involving the domain and range of inverse functions. So do be aware of that. Um, it is handy to know. Okay. But other than that, then, that's really everything that we need here for functions and mappings. Like I said, this material here is largely a recap of GCSE material, so hopefully nice and straightforward. So all we're going to do now is just take a look at one quick practice question here for composite and inverse functions. So if we just take a look then at one practice question here, we've been given three functions. I've got f of x, g of x, and h of x. And we're asked to find a number of different things here. Now, like I said in the introduction, this is largely a recap of GCSE mass material. So hopefully this question here is nice and straightforward. But like I said, it's just more of a quick recap for functions. So for the first part, then part A, we're looking to find this composite function here of f g of x. So f g of x. How do we find this composite function here? Well, remember, when we're working with composite function, now we have to work from right to left. So in this case here, my function g of x gets substituted into the function f here, okay? So g of x is 3x plus 2. So basically what's happening here then is wherever there's an x then for the function f of x, I replace that with my function here, g of x. So what that would look like then is it's going to be x squared, where x in this case is 3x plus 2. So I get 3x plus 2 all squared. So 3x plus 2 all squared. And then we have minus one, so don't forget the minus one here. So that was my x squared minus one, but x in this case becomes my function g of x, which is 3x plus two. So we're gonna expand these double brackets here. So 3x times 3x will give me 9x squared. I get 9x squared, I'd get 3x times two. Um, so 3x times it would be 6x, we'd then get it again, so 2 times 3x would also be 6x, so 6x plus 6x would give me 12x. So I get 12x there, and then finally 2 times 2 would be 4, so I get plus 4, minus the 1, giving me plus 3 there. Okay, so what we have there is f g of x. That's part A done. Moving on to part B then. We're now looking to find g f of x. So the other way around now. So g f of x. So this time then, I'm now going to substitute this function here f of x into g. So wherever there's an x then in g, I replace that with this function here f of x. So I'm going to get three lots of x squared minus 1 plus 2. So we get three lots of x squared 
minus one plus two. So don't forget the plus two here. That's probably the most common mistake when working with composite functions. People forget the rest of the actual function. I get three lots of x squared minus one plus two. So if I just expand this out here, what would I get? I get 3x squared minus 3. I get 3x squared. 3 times minus 1 is minus 3, plus the 2 there to give me minus 1. Okay, so we get 3x squared minus 1 there. And like you can see here, clearly, fg of x is not equal to gf of x. So it just kind of shows that, that um, you know, what we mentioned in the introduction, in this case, um, fg of x. Generally speaking, is not equal to g f of x. Okay. So like you can see that 9x squared plus 12x plus 3 is not the same as 3x squared minus 1. Okay, so that's part B answered. If we move on to C now, again, we've got another composite function here. So now we've got h g of x. So h g of x. So again, working from right to left here, the function g of x, so that is 3x plus 2, that gets substituted into h of x. So wherever there's an x then in h of x, we replace that with g of x. I'm going to get 4 over, so x here, we replace that with 3x plus 2, and then don't forget the minus 1. So I get 4. My x, and like we said, we replace that with 3x plus 2. I've got 3x plus 2 minus the 1. If I simplify this here, I'm going to get 4 all over 3x, and then 2 minus 1 gives me 1 there. So I get 4 over 3x plus 1. So 4 over 3x plus 1 there. And there we have it. So that's the three composite functions there that we needed to evaluate. So that's part A done, part B, and part C. So now we move on to inverse functions here. So for D then, we're looking to find the inverse of the function f of x. So we need to find the inverse of that function. How do we do that? Well, to begin with here, what we do is we let y equal f of x. So let y equal f of x. So let y equal f of x here. So in that case, what I've got is y equals x squared minus 1. And what I'm going to do now is rearrange and make x a subject. So I'm going to add 1 to both sides. So I can see then that x squared is equal to y plus 1. So I get y plus 1 there. And then I take the square root here of both sides. So in that case then x would be equal to the square root of y plus 1. <clears throat> so I get the square root of y plus 1, like so. But remember, we want to give this as an inverse function here. So x equals the square root of y plus 1 isn't an inverse function. So what I do now is I replace my x here with f inverse of x, and then any y's I replace with x. So what we get here then, for the inverse of x, so f inverse of x here, so like we said, we replace x with f inverse of x, and then we replace any y's here with x. So I get the square root of x plus 1. Okay, and there we have it. So that's what we should get there for part D. Let's move on to part E then. We should have enough room down here to, to answer part E. We might just have to clear the screen for part F. So for E then, we're looking for the inverse of g of x. So g of x is 3x plus 2. So again, I start by letting y equal g of x in this case then. So let y equal g of x. So if y equals g of x here, then y is equal to 3x plus 2. So y is equal to 3x plus 2. And again, all I'm going to do here then is make x a subject. So rearranging and making x a subject. I'm going to start by subtracting 2 off both sides. So 3x is equal to y minus 2. So 3x equals y minus 2. And then finally, x would be equal to y minus 2 all over 3. But remember, this isn't for x. This is for the inverse now. So this is the inverse of g of x. So I do that next to this here. We get g inverse of x is equal. So I've replaced x with g inverse of x, and then any y's we replace with x. So I'm going to get x minus 2. So I get x minus 2 all over 3 there. Okay. So there we have it. So that's the solution to E. 
So we'll take that one off. And then finally, we've got F here. So this is the inverse of H of X. So let me just quickly clear the screen here to answer part F. If you don't already have this, just pause the video. Just take notes if you need to. So for part F then, we're now looking for the inverse here of H of X. So again, we start by letting Y equal H of X. So let Y equal H of X. Okay. In that case, then what that means is Y equals four over X minus one. So Y is equal to four over X minus one. So from here, it's up to you how you do this, whether you take the reciprocal now, so that X minus one is a numerator, or you start by, you know, multiplying both sides by X minus one. It's completely up to you which way you go about this. Um, what I'm going to do here is just take the reciprocal of both sides. So what I'm going to get then is one over Y. So one over Y is equal to X minus one over four. Okay. Like so. Now I want to get rid of the denominator here. So obviously what we're looking to do here is make X a subject. So I want to get rid of this denominator of four. I'm going to times both sides by four. So I'm going to get four over Y is equal to X minus one. So four over Y is equal to X minus one. And then finally to get X on its own here, I need to add one to both sides. So therefore X is equal. So I get four over Y plus one. So four over Y plus one. And then like we said here, this isn't the answer. It needs to be in terms of H inverse of X. So replacing X with H inverse of X. And then replacing any Y's here with X, I get four over X plus one there. Okay, so four over X plus one gives us the inverse there for the function H of X. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution to F and that gives the solution to that practice question there, question one. And that brings the end of this video on functions and mappings.